today with a very important session on globalization, global news, and the role of the national media. We just want to remind our, remind our viewers that we had talked previously about the new Muslim media, then we had a special panel on the new international media, and today we're going to talk about the possibility of a global media. When we say international media, we are still looking at nation as a unit and interact among these units. So that when we talk about globalization and global media, we are talking about the whole world being a single unit and forms of communication and patterns of communication that are emerging within this unit. Today we have four very distinguished panelists to address those issues. First and foremost, we have Mr. P. J. Mee, who is head of ARY One World News, and he is the head of Europe and U.S. divisions. Then we have Ms. Ina Dubinsky, who is from Soviet Union, and now she is the host of a program called Talk to America, a Russian language program, call-in program, that is, listened into and talked into by a large number of Russians living in that country today. Next we have Linda Handy, uh, who is a friend of the community and news editor for Washington Report and Middle East Affairs, one of the very few newspapers that gives a balanced account of Middle East situation in this country. And finally we have Mr. Aaron Heil, who was a former deputy director of Voice of America, and he's also author of a book that I'm holding in my hand, very appropriately titled, Voice of America, a History. So partly we are going to review this history today, and I welcome all of you. Now let me ask you, since you are all participant observers, is there a real possibility of globalized news, or global news? Where we don't look at the perspective of one country, but find some objective transnational perspective. An example will be what happened between England and Iran. England says they were kidnapped, Iran says they were arrested. Is there a neutral point for global news to take and can we transcend that moment into a moment that doesn't take a national point of view but have some perspective that are relatively objective vis-a-vis these national stands? I think that would be very difficult, but I think not impossible. I think information is available from so many sources. Joseph Nye, who has talked about soft power, were later renamed smart power of Harvard University, has said uh, that there is a paradox of plenty. There are so many different sources of news in the world, and people tend more and more to multitask, as I think we were talking about before this program, where they're doing a number of things at once. Attention deficits, then, are growing. So here a paradox of plenty in terms of information, and then a, an attention deficit. And so the big problem will be how to overcome all of that. Can there be a single source? I suspect not. I think people will more and more be comparing the rich variety of viewpoints that they will get on the air. And I think Al Jazeera English is an example of trying to head in the direction of accommodating perhaps the different interest patterns than are usually ascribed to, to, to Western media in a universal language. So, Mr. Hyde, you have hit so many interesting points in one go that I need, uh, I feel the need to go over some of them one by one. Uh, there may not be a single source, but is it possible to have some standard language, standardized language? Uh, as Hirsch has said, such a literacy does not depend on other things but to know certain words and concepts and terminology in common stock, ideas in common. Can there be certain international standards of looking at things that are applied in common then? And people still have difference of how they apply them, how they interpret them, how they relate to them, but there will be some global norms and standards of observing, reporting, and discussing. Is that possible? That would be very interesting if you had a consortium of major national broadcasters and international broadcasters to discuss that very topic. I think it would be fascinating. In practice, very difficult, although I cite to you the example of Sesame Street, with which you're probably familiar, and Sesame Street does it, in my view, in exactly the right way. The Sesame Street producers go out in the field, as Gary Knell of that esteemed organization has told us, and they consult right at the very beginning with the producers in a particular country. And therefore, they adopt, they adopt the terminology that that country has before they co-produce the program with uh, people in other countries providing the funding and sometimes the resources. So consequently, you have a program that really fits, is watched by kids, but believe it or not, there is a huge overlap audience of adults. 
I heard, for example, that 180 million viewers in India watch Sesame Street as a result of this collaborative process. We would hope that in international broadcasting and in national broadcasting that more and more there would be the cooperation and the listening and the co-productions of uh, programming on television as well as radio. Again, that's a very interesting point, but I find this to be correctly. That is re-nationalization of a given message. You take a message and you repackage it along with symbol system of the local culture to make it more understandable and more acceptable. Yet the vision, the primary message, the insight is very national and specific to one culture. What I'm saying is, is it possible to go to a second level? Let me ask you the question away. Is it possible to denationalize news? Where it's not produced from the perspective of any one country? No, I don't, I don't think it's possible. I mean, in, in theory, it's a fantastic idea. But I don't think it's practical because, uh, number one, you have to, I mean, with the international structure as it stands, you really, have to, you really have to restructure the whole thing again. And um, coming to your original uh, uh, question, that uh, uh, perhaps uh, when we were talking just before the program about these sailors, but the British sailors being uh, you know, caught out and the world media reporting it, everybody, I agree with Alan, because until and unless we don't have a variety of reporting, then you don't get the right perspective, because everyone has a different angle towards it. I mean, if the sailors were caught, perhaps by Iran, Iraq might have a different angle. The United States might have a different angle. Britain might have a different angle. So different kind of reporting, again, give you a better perspective of understanding of what is actually happening. But if you have one source, then I'm afraid it's just going to be one news. And one news doesn't suffice in prison moment. Why does that have to one news or one source? Why is to have pluralism placed beyond nationalism? Can we think of pluralism beyond nationalism? That's the question I'm asking. Otherwise, we'll be asking for expectation of everybody's thought in a single standardized, fixed, and forced idea. I'm not proposing that. What I'm saying is, is media pluralism beyond nationalism possible? And then you can go to Russia and see if there's a lesson to be drawn. Sure, I'd be happy. Uh, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on uh, what Alan said about success of Sesame Street. What we observe here is the success of introduction of American notions that did not exist in the country where Sesame Street took root. And that's a different, uh, actually, notion and a different matter. The way historically attempts to create this common language, this common understanding, one perception of everything, and the good example of, it, of that is the common language Esperanto. We know where it is now. It's dead language, right? <laughs> so culturally, I don't think it is possible to create the same, the same perception of the same matters. Culturally, historically, people are different. They will always perceive things different, differently. And that's the advantage of actually, of communicating, of creating joint programs, of working together more, of communicating more, because you can always discuss different matters. And you can find consensus, because that's how, you know, the truth comes out. Okay. It looks like we are going to move in the direction of nationalist but uh, some cooperative moves. Will that be your judgment also? I, I think that that's the only way to go, really. Um, it seems like language is so fraught, um, like a Palestinian terrorist and one... Uh, freedom yeah, uh, and is a freedom fire. How, how can you decide? And if you have one superpower right now, what if they decide to do it Fox News uh, <laughs> way? That won't be a service to anyone. So, yeah. If that being the case, then it seems like we need to talk about patterns of flow of information among countries. And I was very much struck by something you had said in your books, and if you allow me, I'll read it very quickly to you and to the rest, and make it the best of our discussion. This is your chapter 14, in which I'm very glad you're sitting next to me. You said, the, to the roof of the world, the Tibetan service miracle, and then you quoted the Lai Lama saying, the launch of the Voice of America, Tibetan service was like daily medicine, for the first time, Tibetans were able to get an alternative perspective on issues that had a direct bearing on their lives. I would like to ask you, do you think Americans get an alternative perspective on their lives on a daily basis? I think increasingly they do. Uh, maybe I'm an unusual viewer uh, of, of television, but uh, I certainly would not miss an evening without tuning into BBC World to get an idea of what's going on in other countries. It's, 
usually unavailable on american media and i think more and more what you will have developing is what i would call the pluralist media consumer and i think more and more we will see in the coming years with the advances in technology and the increased information available imagine 10 million new people online in india every month imagine a tiny impoverished west african country named gambia where more than half the people have cell phones so i think more and more with these alternative sources of information are going to become available within any given national information space and therefore increasingly people will be better informed and will expect to get their answers from different sources than their own national media mr hyla understand and i agree with that but that is true of other countries my question about united states for instance if you look in africa now we have what is called 3 plus minus 1 language rule people end up either with three languages or four or two languages the united states is one of the few countries moving in the direction of monolingualism mm -hmm. if you look at other countries which are relatively close societies us made it its business to beam messages into them to open them to up to international competing pluralistic news where is the reverse order of that information flow well the reverse order you see i mean if you go back into world war 2 dr jesse gobels is a prime example of that i mean his broadcasts to the west were in english and uh, he wanted to make it a point and it all fit of course he was following his policies and then in the same breath if you look down at pearl harbor i think it was just a matter of what 43 or 49 days before the voice of america started operating and they wanted to the americans actually wanted to have the voice there outside as well so this media war or communication war has started i would say in modern times after the uh, during the second world war and it has continued and even in the vietnam war we've seen ho chi minh city having their own um, you know radio broadcasts in english you know telling the american soldiers that you know you're doing this wrong you're doing that right and so on forth and vice versa voice of america retaliating to it now all this has continued because where it matters the universal language will be used where it really actually matters to home in a political point home in an ideology but where it matters as a general news i don't think that is that is going to be effective you see if you look at for instance iraq or you look at pakistan you look at bangladesh people are listening to 3 4 5 6 7 different channels so the media literacy is far higher and far greater and that is being guaranteed by programs like uh, mr binsky's program where there is a specific technological beaming in of these messages so people call and listen to it on the other hand i teach at a university and i think i can give you some sense of my sampling of my students they hardly listen to one single source so what i'm saying here is where is the equivalent of that open globalized society where we say nationalism is not going to change or disappear anytime soon fine but even the context of multinational pluralistic perspectives are they flowing back into this country well i think one thing that is happening is that if you look at the proliferation of english language channels around the world you have the chinese now with a 24 hour a day website you have uh, russia today going on the air uh, also with a 24/7 service you have the iranians expanding their service you have even the french uh, with an english television service that's now up to 8 hours and will be increased shortly So there is a move toward using the universal language as a transmitter of a variety of ideas. And so that may be partly what you're asking in terms of the United States. I'm asking States. exactly that, but I'm also sort of not asking you to comment on the fact that in 2004 at the Democratic Party convention when Al Jazeera had their banner up it they were asked to take it down. Al Jazeera even of today they have 98 million households worldwide. They have only 150,000 in the United States. most of them through satellite system in the dearborn and uh, michigan areas so why is when we are promoting competition in other countries by all these art artistic means and uh, you know these technological means we are blocking the same pluralistic competition of ideas and news sources in this country if it can be done because i think the thing that i've noticed lately in studying the media internationally is that al jazeera is on the website and more and more people more and more web viewers are looking at it in video on the website regardless of whether a station grants well, a license Mr. Hyde, that hardly shows us the openness of the society to a competing idea what would you say 
they're not permitted to go on the airwaves, right. and that is ridiculous. So right. there is a Russia like, yeah. you know, ban on the flow of news into this country. What we are saying is, they should let, the principle is wonderful, let there be free flow of information in all directions. Well, but there is actually freedom for this flow of information. Russia today is not the only example of penetration of Russian media in the United States. They do Pardon have, me? well, I can tell you, they do have monthly or even weekly editions of Russian newspapers in the Washington Post, in New York Times. So you can read a lot of Russian, you know, perspective of world events or of events in Russia itself. Now, a lot of Russian channels now are working on having their satellite broadcast here in the United States. And Americans are open-minded to that. Russia is blocking American uh, broadcast. It's a different matter. Russia but nobody is blocking Russian broadcast here in the United States. They true. do have Russian channels that is here. True, but and not only Russian, by the way. You can watch Arabic. You can watch, uh, you know, in French. You can watch in German. Any languages, if you have cable television, well, I understand it's not that democratic. Some people do, do not subscribe to cable. But if you do have cable, you do have access to a multiple, you know, to a variety of languages. Even cable actually. has not given access as yet to Al Jazeera mm -hmm. English, right. all right? So the first channel that has truly started to compete, located in a different paradigm. BBC is located in the same par paradigm. This was the first major channel located in a different paradigm, has been blocked. So I think this is where U.S. is failing to live up to its own ideals and principles. And that's the question of, you know, what I want to ask you is what do you see the shape of news in five years, ten years, twenty years? Do you think these uh, difficulties are going to be overcome, these hurdles will be removed, and there will be free flow of information in all directions, or this will be the continued pattern of news? See, this will change. This will Obviously, there'll, there'll be a time when it when it has to change. I mean, as much as Al Jazeera when it first came, it came with a big with a big bang, and everybody started looking. I mean, the regular channels and the regular media started looking. Excuse me, but who is this? And where are they coming from? And then all of a sudden, after a few sensational news items, particularly relating to Bin Laden, that this channel actually made inroads, and people started looking at it. And then, in the same breath, this channel was banned in Iraq. For, 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 for certain reasons, and it was banned for one month. And then here, as you say, why isn't it being allowed here, is probably because uh, I, I feel the authorities might feel that it's probably not giving the right message, because here... <laughs> but Mirsab, that is the argument of every dictator, mm -hmm. that you're not giving the right message, and they always have a reason to prove that. Do we have uh, a dictator here? Well, partly it's a dictatorial regime in the sense of not allowing that information. It need not be a dictator. It could be a democratically elected leader acting as a dictator when her, she, he or she does not allow the rule of law. For instance, in this country, Judge John Gleason on June 14, 2006 said, if you are not a citizen, you can be arrested solely on the basis of your religion, country of origin, or ethnicity, and held indefinitely without explanation. Go and look at the New York Times front page. David Cole has filed a suit against that. He has not been able to get it overturned. When in the United States a judge says you can be arrested for being a Muslim indefinitely without explanation, that's the definition of fascism. Because it mistreats people and has dual standards. But that happens everywhere in the world. But that doesn't make it right, does it? No, it certainly doesn't. But at the same time, as we say, see, we are coming out. I mean, our minds are developing. I mean, today we are thinking about the same world where we were fighting each other, and today we are calling it the global village. So the mindset is changing, and the mindset has, I, I would say specifically, changed probably more after 9-11. And prior to that, nobody was even willing to uh, think of a change, because everybody was so set in their own uh, views uh, whatsoever, then all of a sudden we see this new change in the, in the global order. And I think... Well, that's a fair enough yeah. argument, but I think the global village makes demand on us for being the global village. There are certain expectations if we are going to look at the whole globe as a single unit. Then there are certain expectations in terms of knowledge production, news production, news reporting, and competing systems of ideas. If you can't go beyond nations, then there has to be a uh, sort of you know, equitable distribution of news among the nations. Yes, but you, 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 you'll still keep your own identity. I mean, you have again a, a prime example, even when you speak of the global village of the European Union. I mean, European Union, they're all the same, but at the same time, the media in the Union works independently of each other. 
I'm not asking for a single freedom. Excuse me, I'm not asking for all media to become one and there should be one single news item. No, I'm not saying. I'm saying two things. Can we go beyond national perspectives on news? If we can't, then can we make sure that flow of information in every direction is open? No, I don't think we can go beyond because every country that, has... That's granted. That's granted. So now the next question is, can we have equally free flow in all directions? I'll tell you, I think the Internet is going to provide that free flow. There, if you go to googlenews.com, you have access to 4,500 newspapers around the world. Okay. And, and that... And the choice is yours. The no choice is yours. Yes. Exactly. And besides, technology develops in leaps and bounds. We don't know what will be invented tomorrow besides Internet. Because there might be ways found to block Internet access. And these examples we do observe in China, where Russia is planning a new law now. But I wanted to comment on your definition of America as a democracy and as a fascist state. I disagree with that. Democracy is not a final destination. Democracy is a process. And certain individuals do make mistakes. But the democracy is when we have checks and balances, when we can tell the judge, you are wrong, and there will be certain mechanisms, certain tools to show him that he is wrong and to make it right. And I think that's what America is about. And again, people do make mistakes. And there are cycles in American history. And one of the very best checks and balances, to borrow Enos' term, is called an election. Exactly. And it may be very, very possible. Mr. Hyde, it may be very, very possible that because of 9-11 even, and the realization on the part of the large body of Americans that what happens out there, what happens over there is important, that it may be that you will have uh, in the next election cycle uh, a president that's far more attuned to the needs to have a conversation with the world and not just speak unilaterally to the world. And I think that may well happen. And I think that will have reverberations in the judicial system in the United States and certainly in the way Americans receive information. Mr. Hart, I feel the need to ask you a question on behalf of people who may think differently the following question. I think there's a little too self-serving understanding of the history. There was not a single election in this country that could change slavery. There had to be war. It was U.S. Supreme Court in Dred Scott case which had said Blacks are not only not citizens, they are not people, they are private property. There was no legislature that overturned overturn that. There had to be a civil war. In 1896, as he was Ferguson said, separate was equal and therefore constitutional. It was the street power that corrected the state power. So what I'm asking is, is it going to be simply the goodwill of the people who rule? When they change their mind, there will be a different way of dealing with people? Or there has to be a critical analysis of these practices by the civil society and the live street in this country, as we talk about Arab street, I'm talking about American street, has to be responsible for the American street to look at not only these causes, but free flow of information. Because my concern is, when I look at the flow of information, that American good people are getting such one-sided information, they are bound to come to one-sided conclusions. For instance, in terms of Iraq, let's look at the multiplicity of sources, how many sources are cited here. And I think Chomsky has repeatedly documented New York Times, the best publication, in terms of the one-sidedness of their news. So what we are accepting, I am accepting American principle as best principle, but I am saying are we honestly applying those best principles to ourselves in terms of open, multiple, competing, pluralistic, close information, where we see people competing in terms of understanding and interpreting our history. That's the question. There is a balance to it. Blogs. You can learn truth if you perceive it differently from many blogs such a free access to information, you can't hide anything. Don't you agree with that? I do. That, and that, I think, is a real hope, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. But I think that does not exonerate the television, the radio, and the newspaper from their responsibility. Blog is, instead of them, not in, in place of them. You know, it's like separate avenue that opens up in a small way. And very few people join a single blog. You can't have millions of people joining blogs. Millions will continue to get their news through the interpreted news that's made available to major channels. And also, uh, may I add, that uh, new uh, news, which is uh, a, a new app new, and that is coming out through SMSs. I mean, mm -hmm. if somebody wants to make a break of news, I mean, it's all coming through mobile technology. I mean, no matter where you are. And uh, that, that, that's a new avenue, which I, 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 I fear is going to be used a lot more. 
I will not feel it. I will welcome it and say, I hope it's going to be used out more. But these are tangential possible means that may rectify. All right. What I'm asking is, in the world, the United States for the foreseeable future is going to be the leader, and people are going to make decisions. They are going to affect hundreds of millions of people. Are we saying the flow of information is judicious and fair, back and forth? See, it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question. I mean, when we when you go back to the, uh, to the times of the slavery, there is more slavery now than there has ever been in the history of mankind. There are 27 million children are in bonded labor. They're in slavery all over the world, and yet nothing is done about it. So, the news faction, you know, wherever you drive it, wherever you take it, I think we have to see it, who is doing what. And what are, what are your priorities at this, at this present, or at any given moment in time? I mean, the priorities seem to take, uh, you know, uh, take precedence over a lot of issues, and uh, particularly about this, about this uh, slavery issue. I mean, this, this is a major issue which no one is really talking about at this present moment. Time. That is the role, if I might say, and that is where international broadcasters like the BBC and the Voice of America can make an enormous difference because they will throw what I call the Klieg lights on a problem slavery, a, a VOA series on child labor in India was, a, was an award-winning program series several years ago. If we continue to base a lot of our programming on the need to be, as I say in Chapter 18 of the book, Voice of America, a voice for the voiceless. And that is a very, very important quality, and if we are that, and truly that, then we can begin to at least illuminate a different perspective, not only in our own country, but abroad. And in our own country, you can see things opening up in the United States, because now people can go to voanews.com, and they can avail themselves of much of this very, very rich information that nobody seems to be much aware of in the media, but eventually all of this is going to come together, and you will have, because of the now, the paradox of plenty, to go back to the original phrase, you will have the traditional media, I think, having to react. They're going to have to start to cover things that they are now not covering in order not to disappear. Be extinct or be, uh, be distinct or be extinct is the word. And they will, re they will recognize that. I hope. Well, don't you think readers can write to their newspapers and magazines and radio shows and say, we want this covered, and really have the voice of readers come out. Do you think we can change things individually? If well, let's look at your publication, which is so dear to me at least. How many mainstream channels or newspapers cover that news? For instance, I went to Voice of America and looked at Judge Gleason's news that reported there. I went there and saw if the verdict about the of Samuel was reported there. Not one of the major issues have been reported. When there are Muslims killed in this country, shot dead by bigots, it's not covered. For instance, General Barkin, when he said, you know, I know my God is the true one and they're not, was it covered by Voice of America? So we are very... My the source of power, nationalism, and future shape of news. In that regard, I see American ideals as the most wonderful and the best ideals. I support them and accept them 100%. And I think it's wonderful to open up a closed Soviet Union and make it a Russia, and make it open. But what about here? So the fact that there are 27 million children in bondage is not a justification for lack of flow of news in this country. So I'm suggesting is why is it at this time where there is such a major civil rights crisis in this country that there is no discussion of that on Voice of America back and forth. That is not there. May I ask you a question? Please. Did you just read the content of the Voice of America site? Did you try and listen to audio files? because I'm sure you would find a lot of discussions, not only straightforward reports or feature stories, but discussions on the exactly issues you know, that you just mentioned. There is a series on the Voice of America called Focus. That's right. And I would be very, very surprised, although I cannot cite you a date, but I would be very, very surprised if that program had not covered this very Absolutely. topic. All right. I, will be, I have been on Voice of America myself many times on the round table. But I have not seen any discussion as a news item of this matter on Voice of America. You no may idea. be right, not as a news item, but we have other formats, programming formats, where it could be featured. Fair enough. I think it's there, it's there but I think the basic responsibility when an event of that nature occurs is news reporting. 
where it's not on the news that it goes to a secondary forum where it might be part of some other discussion. But really what I'm saying is, if the shape of the world is media pluralism, how do we conceive that shape in this country? It cannot be more of the same. It cannot be 300 channels that have the same perspective. It has to be 310 channels, where 300 have one perspective and 10 have different perspective, not the same, but 10 different perspectives, 11 perspectives all total. And then I would disagree with you that news reporting under that circumstances would be the best way to communicate. The best way to communicate actually would be a talk show where different ideas could be discussed and different approaches. That's how you achieve pluralism of opinions. That's true. But first the documentation of facts has to be done which is news and then discussion which is different perspective on the news. So if we make it disappear or as Chomsky has very correctly pointed out when some unpleasant things happen they are reported once in the New York Times and then disappear from the institutional memory. On the other hand we keep certain unpleasant things attack to other people very much in the institutional memory. And therefore, the one question that I think, again, was very much in the context of the global media is, each national media has an associated institutional memory. And when we report, we report based on that. Do you see any chances of transcendence, expansion, rectification of those institutional memories? No, I don't think so. Because um, I'll uh, tell you that, for example, after 9-11, uh, CNN and uh, Fox reported America under attack. Now, America wasn't under attack. It was, a, it was an act of some irresponsible, I would say, people of the lowest order who did what they did you know, at, uh, in, in New York. But when it came America under attack and this broadcast was being seen in all the countries, and particularly the Islamic countries, the image was given as though there was a, there was a, there was a fight going on between Islam and, and, and the United States of America. Now, this kind of hype, which is created from one side, will have a negative result. America was never under attack at any given moment in time. It was the act of some, you know, some, some callous, ignorant terrorists and some bunch of them. That doesn't mean the rest of the world is like that. But when the media comes along and tries to portray all of this, then yes, there is a negative result out of it. In the 1965 war, I do remember that the Voice of America, when Pakistan was at war with India, there was a, there was a big uh, news, oh, Voice of America, let's listen to what they say. BBC, let's listen to what they say. And all of a sudden, people were looking towards these two main institutions to see as to uh, what the real news was because no one was trusting the local news around and uh, to, to authenticate it was the Voice of America and the BBC. Absolutely. So over the years what has really happened is that the media has taken everything in their own hand and they play the tune as they like it. Now sometimes the tune works and sometimes the tune doesn't work and in this instance unfortunately the tune hasn't worked to what you're trying to refer to. Yes, what I'm saying is among other things you have actually anticipated my next question and that was region by region relationship, all right? So we have a situation in the Middle East, for instance, which I think has been exacerbated by the type of coverage. But again, I think the rectification is not to lessen it but to expand it, make it more. I'm not calling for less, I'm calling for more. So maybe many more perspectives are given. U.S. Occupying authority has a more open-minded attitude towards flow of information inside Iraq than inside the United States. Okay. But let's look at South Asia, for instance. What's the flow of information there and how do we see it integrating into the larger scheme of things? One is the model that was very correctly pointed out, the cooperative model, which I think is a very important model needs to be followed. And second is the model of people now, I think your own channel, ARY, takes many things produced by India, I don't know. They're not even modified, they just sort of know, I think. Uh, not from India, we don't take anything from India. Yes. In Pakistan, recently they have, you know, recently I mean seven years, they have licensed 23 news television channels. And many of them are doing that. So there is a cross pollination of ideas, there is cooperative projects, there is simple borrowing, and now there is hybridization of the programs where people from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh come into the Middle East, joint programs are done and floated. Then if you look at the Indian movie, for instance, Bollywood, that has another feature where you have mixing of languages, you have songs in English and Hindi and Urdu and some other languages, and you have dancers from all over the world who come and combine. To me, this seems some transcendence of the national color and national factor. It may not be comprehensive, but it's there. 
So I'm just wondering, how do you see being in South Asia? How do you see? See, first of all, in South Asia, let's uh, get one thing right: is that people in South Asia do not have the same command of English as perhaps in the West. It is not a language. It is a it is a it is a multiple of languages, you know, which which float around in, in, in that part of the world. Now here, what I would say is the choice of words has to be very carefully uh, chalked out. I mean. When you immediately use a word, I mean, like I'm here now, and uh, what I'm seeing on Fox, terror alert one, terror alert two, terror red, and this and that. Now, this gives you an unnecessary hype. It's not an easy or a comfortable thing, not even for the Americans, let alone for somebody from outside. So it gives you a very uneasy feeling. Now, these are the kind of words which should be carefully uh, sorted out, thought about, and then put out. Because... Words can play a major important part in, I would say, alienating each other. As, as you say, in, even in regional um, areas, it, it, it really bonds people. But it's just a choice of words. And I think that really needs to be looked into. Choice of words? Well, I think um, the fact that you mentioned Bollywood, it is really fascinating. And I really like that idea. And actually, this intermingling of cultures we do watch it and hear it and listen to it every day and every time because a lot of things, good things, advanced things that develop in one part of the world and then come to the other part of the world can be just adopted in the original language. It is easier to use, let, let's say in Russian, a lot of English terms for business. It's easy just to use them as they are instead of trying to explain them in long sentences. Mm -hmm. So this intermingling or um, you know, introduction of foreign languages in other countries, it's a normal uh, process. It irritates a lot of people, and they try to keep this you know, pure you know, language of their own. But it doesn't work always to their mm -hmm. advantage, I think. Yes, and again, even in translation, when the literature is there, for instance, one, one reads Haji Murad by Tolstoy. That's right. Even in English, you get that sensibility of a profound mind at work, looking painfully at these very, very complicated relationship, sense of the self and the other, and grades of the other, and you are continuously in thought of the other. But that is the treasure that we have all in common. And I think translation makes it possible for people to claim that treasure in common instead of saying, it's only Russian literature, it becomes world literature. But that's what I'm saying. Our, we see movement in literature, where we go from national to truly global. Where once you understand the you are fascinated by the imagination. Last night I was translating poet philosopher Iqbal to somebody. And he was saying the person who is thankless is the one who is lost in the universe. The person who is really one of faith, he is the one in, whom, in whose consciousness the universes are lost. And the, my friend said, how does it, you know, poet come to that conclusion? How do we recognize the breadth of the consciousness that can take cosmologies into it? But it is by just being able to understand that we share that. But that is not happening so much in the media. That's the language question. But that's question. the trickiness of an intelligent mind. You can have all the same words, but you can have different contexts. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I think it's, again, not to, to say that everything is going to become one, but continue to look at the progress. This is a progress report, in a way. We're looking at our own progress, or lack thereof, and say, where have we come so far in terms of language, in terms of content, in terms of design, format, addresses, addressee, all of those things, and what changes have taken place, what changes need to take place. And sometimes it's just the sense of alienation that makes a big breach, and then it becomes very difficult to bring people together. And sometimes it's the need of the Chinese government just to have the word apology in the letter issued by the United States, all right? And that uh, rectifies everything. So we understand that, but we are also looking at the larger forms and shapes of that. So it's but, very simple. See, if we go in even a larger sort of a shape and form, in the words of Khalil Gibran, you know, the Lebanese poet, he said, wisdom is not in words. It is the meaning within words. And if the meaning is simple and straight, the message homes in much more quicker. And that is the need of the R. That is the need of the R, because we are fighting a global illiteracy rate. We are fighting a situation where there is fanaticism. We are fighting a situation where there's extremism. We are fighting a race where there's poverty. We are fighting a race where there's unemployment. We are fighting a race where there's not enough food in the world. 
Yeah, I'll be fighting no. those fights. Yes, yes. But, no, but, but, but this, fights. This, is, this is what I'm coming to. We need to be explaining to people in the simplest possible of manners rather than taking them to Timbuktu and then coming back in and putting in the same thing. We've got to be absolutely straight to the point, make it simple, people will respond. Well, mm -hmm. you see what you said earlier, the list that you gave very eloquently is the list that Willie Brandt in his book, North South, The Scheme for Survival, has listed. And he has said for each tank bought, how many primary schools can be built? But they are not being built. We are buying the tanks. So therefore, the discussion of tank and school has to be simultaneously there. Gibran also said, nobody could make me speechless but one who asked, who are you? So words and words of self-identity are always going to be there, and one has to look at them. One of the problems that I see in the United States, which is by Charles Taylor in his book on multiculturalism, he says, it's very easy for us to agree that we are all equal politically. But we cannot agree that all cultures living in this country are equal. And that creates a big question of larger unity within the country. And he quotes one of the writers, he says, when the Zulus produced their tall style to read him, now, many people have commented on that that says that is a Eurocentric view, first of all, to think that Tolstoy is the ultimate author, and then to think the Zulus have not produced one, and then to be the judges of whether or not they have produced one. So this is not the question of equality of a person on the street as an individual. It is the equality in a multicultural, multinational society among groups that has to be reflected on. And therefore, not only the word meaning of the word is always sort of subject to speculation, how this speculation ties back to identity is all the question. Group identity, individual identity. And you, my friend, are not only the one reporting the identity, you are some way also shaping the identity. I'm awed by your power and I ask you, how are you using that power? See, whenever you're in that driving seat, I mean the seat where you're sitting in is a very powerful seat. And this seat can do a lot of good and a lot of damage. Now, again, as coming up to, as uh, what the lady said, I think it's up to uh, programs like this, which can shape people's minds. Now, if we talk positive, then there will be a positive image giving outside, uh, being given outside. Now, if we go on the negative side, there will be a negative image, and then there will be further negative thoughts coming out. So I feel that, you know, when I am perhaps sitting in that chair or something to that effect, my aim and my job is to make sure that we have to be the eternal optimists. And well, I, hope, I hope we are not confusing critical with negative. The difference between critical and negative. No, but we can even make the critical into a positive. That's the ultimate outcome of its process, you know, because think and then we lead to the positive. So I hope what you do, and I see you doing it, is being critical and then positive is the outcome that people develop on their own. And this is the whole group is here to learn. And let's take, a, you know, I think we're not asked, Mr. Winsky. What are the lessons we can learn from you for the globalized village that came out of Russia or Soviet Union? From the Soviet Union, it's been a long way. And it actually developed in a very positive way at first. Uh, the very famous Russian uh, comic actually said that it was interesting at some point after the Soviet Union collapse, it was interesting, more interesting to read than to live. So uh, it was really open society. It was becoming open society. Now the recent events show where it goes because the major network, Russian news service, that is controlled by Kremlin, uh, all its editors, all its management, was ordered to have 50% of all news positive and to end any newscast in a positive way and to have America's image as the image of the enemy. That's an official policy of a major network. So you can draw your own conclusions from that. Well, what I draw, the main conclusion is that nationalism is well and alive and drawing the lines again. But what can we draw from that in terms of that brief window that opened up? What made that window open up? What opened what? The brief window that, you know, that it was going to be an open society for a while. What led to that possibility? Well, that possibility actually showed how many talented journalists there are in the Russian media, how much they can achieve, how much they can contribu contribute into the development of the civil society, 
which is being suppressed now, which showed recent demonstrations in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and uh, Nizhny Novgorod. So that's what it showed. And also, that period of Russian history showed how much America lost by not understanding what it should have done to support this growth of democracy. We neglected them. We didn't help them the way they expected us to help. Uh, this notion, by the way, of you know, not interfering into internal affairs, let the democracy grow on its ground, didn't work in Russia. They needed our help, and we didn't do it. And now what we see, actually, we see a very special way of evolving of Russian democracy, managed democracy. Do you understand what it means? I don't. <laughs> so, and there is no special way for a democracy. So this, this period in, in the development of Russian media showed that there is still hope. I believe there is still hope, and I am an optimist in that regard. But currently, um, maybe, you know, elections will change something, but there is not much hope in that regard. Can, because everything is being dictated from Kremlin. Please. Can I wear, please wear please an optimist's please. hat yeah, absolutely for please. a moment? Please I mean, there are two things that have happened recently that have struck me. Have you heard of the responsibility to protect? And that's a UN doctrine. Here you had a rather, and I think most people would call it dismal session, the World Summit of the United Nations in 2005. And a lot of the rather more constructive elements were discarded and watered down through the intervention of various parties, the United States and others. But they all agreed on the basis of Darfur, of the Rwanda genocide, of the events in the Balkans, they all agreed that for the first time the international community had a responsibility to protect citizens in another country. The first time that the wall of sovereignty erected in 1848 was broken and chipped back a little bit. Now that says to me that there is a broad awareness and support among both the Western nations and the United States and other countries of the necessity of trying to intervene and rescue people who are in dire need or whose entire civilizations are at risk. That would be one view of an optimist. A second view would be the satellite bouquets. And when I say satellite bouquets, I mean I was driving with a chap who has the XM radio and he had subscribed to a service of international stations. And in the space of 24 hours, he could hear all of these different viewpoints and the programming of all of them and arrive at his own conclusions, weigh one aspect against another aspect, one viewpoint against another viewpoint. It seems to me that technology, along with a growing awareness of the world on the part of many people, and those who are subscribing online, and as mentioned earlier, the SMSs and the podcasts and YouTube even, although I say that with some reservation because it's not altogether a public good, but all of that is creating a more informed world. And as the world becomes more informed, I think people will be arriving at conclusions based on more sources. And I think the trajectory is only higher than it was 10 years ago. And I imagine in Russia even that could be a factor, although Russia is tightening up the flows of information into the country. I can't believe that somehow, as the street demonstrations of late have shown, that there is a latent desire not to leave the world entirely, despite the, the uh, authoritarian, increasingly authoritarian Kremlin that we see today. Mr. Hal, your, your optimism is quite contagious and I feel optimist also. But my sense is that the basis of this optimism are rather too vague in general. What she said, that Mr. Binsky said, and what you said, I think, needs a little more reflection and a little meta-analysis. Uh, Mr. Binsky said, the idea not to intervene. And then she said, they need our help. And what you had said, the world community had decided not to leave it open. I think there is 
a general agreement, and there have been, I think, some Harvard scholars who have said, we need to redefine the notion of the state in the 21st century. No state should be allowed to do two things, to oppress its own people and start a war against others. I'm all for that. But the point that Mr. Binsky made, and I'm not dismissing it, and yet I think it's, it needs further discussion, when we say a country like Russia needs foreign intervention for the inculcation of democracy, then we cannot but compare it with Iraq, what happened there, inculcation of democracy by force. So there are very serious consequences of these ideas. It is the whole question of ends and means. Not only the ends have to be democratic and peaceful and based on the consent of the government, the means also have to be the same thing. So when we say we will not allow, for instance, none other than Henry Kissinger in his book, Does America Need a Foreign Policy, has said, U.S. should not submit itself to the inter universal jurisdiction of the international law, court, criminal court, international court. So then we are saying everybody else will be subject to that kind of intervention except us. Two problems. One of double standards and second is the issue of where you go into countries and reorder their systems against their will or at a rate that they are not ready for. And I think there are consequences for that. Then what results is not democracy or liberation. It results in occupation, interference, and further polarization of the world. How do we deal with that? And what's the role of the media in the middle of this thing? Because media has to take a position on this approach. Well, I think media, if it's the kind of media that many of us idealize on this panel, will be a media that will be critical of the United States, will be critical of its double standard in this case, and allow people to arrive at their own conclusions eventually. Uh, the pendulum will swing, and the United States, as we see now, really, I think I can say in the debate on the environment and global warming, you see a real sea change in the United States in viewing that, at least in the public mind as well as in the official mind. On that critical and positive note, let's take a break. We'll be back after brief intermission. Thank you. Mr. Linda Hanley, uh, you have a unique perspective on news within the United States. You have a small publication that speaks unofficial truths. Tell us, what's your experience and what can be learned from your experience? I am very worried about our U.S. media. I, I see um, the media becoming tabloid news hype um, and not talking about important things like Dr. Samuel Arian's arrest and all the things that really matter to our human rights in this country. And I'm very concerned unless um, newspapers and magazines are allowed to talk about these things and, and this, the television is just, it's turning into tabloid television instead. So I'm more worried about U.S. media than I am about international media. I think when I travel I see people overseas know so much more about our politics than Americans know. <laughs> I think we have a very informed global community and we have to work on this community in the United States. And I think partly that can be just very really quickly reviewed by looking at the format of international news on ABC or CBS or CNN and we can see how much general international news is there. But let's end it on a positive note because that's the end result we want. Uh, we'll start just any direction, anybody can jump in. You know, what is the, what is the shape of news we see in one generation 25 years? And what do you think will be the nature of flow of information globally, in your judgment? Anybody? See, it all depends. Like today, as you say, 25 years on, the world is a changed platform. And uh, we call it a global village. Today, I feel that uh, the media, if it has to play an important role, it can certainly play an important role by being absolutely targetive. And by that, I mean, for example, they have to go after policymakers the actual policy makers. I mean, for example, uh, one Mr. Wolfowitz, who was uh, deemed to be seen as the architect of the Iraq war. I mean, if somebody had just targeted him and started putting questions At to that him. moment in time, things might have been different, mm -hmm. because then perhaps he might have advised something else to the president. So we need to target such important people that, excuse me, before you come out and, uh, with some sort of a policy, which might be good, which might be bad, but let's work it out in the public domain. Let's discuss it here. Let's talk about it. And then, fair enough, 
do what you have to do. So that is the line I feel that the media, international media, should be doing throughout because they are the people who really matter. More discussion, more critical analysis. Yes. Well, my vision of the future media, because I am a strong believer in democracy in process, is that commercial media will be declining and national public media will be re-emerging because national public media can bring to the public what it actually needs and strives to learn internationally, locally, nationally. Commercial media shows and tells what sells mm -hmm. and national public media does what journalistic integrity and uh, pluralism and uh, you know unbiased approach takes. So that's my vision of it. Just to understand correctly, Mr. Dubinsky, will this national public media be funded by taxpayers? I believe so, because democracy in process means stronger civil society. And as people become you know more powerful financially socially, emotionally, in all regards. So they will be more willing to fund what actually speaks to them, the language and the content that they would like to hear my, or my, to my, see my, or to read. My question is, won't that turn journalists into government employees and create a consequence of its own? It's not the government. It's two different things. Public and government, it's, it's different things. All right. Is it like Voice of America is public or government? Voice of America is the United States federal government radio and TV and actually internet, you know, multimedia station. It is being funded okay. by U.S. Congress. Okay. We do not depend on any, uh, you know, secretary or any ministry or any agency. We are a separate entity, but it is still funded by U.S. Congress. National public radio or national public television, you know what source of uh, it's life and well-being is so it's different things okay that's a very good distinction thank you thank yes. you and i would hope that citizens pay more attention to the media and fund media themselves and and complain to the media when they see something wrong or that they don't believe is correct um and i'm thinking that uh, perhaps media sh i mean non-profit media is the way to go because if it's profit driven then they are looking for the bad news or the the hype or the Anna Nicole's um, father of her child and stuff. I mean, try to get nonprofit funding and, and real news out there for readers and listeners. Well, the issue that Mr. Mead was saying, the issues of poverty and hunger and, you know, unemployment. And, yeah, so, so. the important stories so, so. instead of wasting our ears and our eyes on garbage. On Anna Nicole Smith. Yeah. yeah. And so absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I agree with all of the panelists that. Uh, information and journalism has to be a serious pursuit. It has to be, I think, uh, a non-commercial pursuit, as has been so eloquently said. And it has to be journalism of inquiry. The journalists must retain their critical faculties at all times and to avoid the kind of misadventures of a Mr. Wolfowitz or anyone else. You cannot uh, permit the officialdom to unchecked move ahead on a path that may lead to disaster. There should be enough voices questioning it, and it's the duty of the media to be that strongest voice. I'm reminded of a story, by the way. I, I see you walking, looking at your watch. No, no, so I'll I'll try no, no please, I said, please. I didn't look at my watch. <laughs> well, I'll try to make it. Please. I'll try to make it quick. There was a Washington Post editor several years ago who assigned a young intern to cover a ceremony of, at the Vietnam Memorial on Memorial Day. And she said, well, that's fine. I can get the text, and I can get past stories from the Internet, and I'll weave everything together. And the editor said, no, you won't. You will go there. So she went there, and it had rained the evening before, and the raindrops were rolling down the edge of the monument, and there was a woman stooped right in the middle where you had the most names, the towering names, the casualties in the war. 
and the woman was stooping down, putting the bouquet there, and then she turned to the reporter, and she said, do you see those drops? They're tears. Now, that story would never have been possible had someone that. sat in a swivel chair and hadn't asked the ultimate question. But I submit that any reader of that story will remember it 10 years from now, and it will sink into their consciousness, and it will certainly enhance the human spirit. And that's what it's all about, enhancing the human spirit through information. You are such an eloquent storyteller, Mr. Hyde. It's a pleasure to have you. I've been in this country for now 35 years, and the longer I have lived in this country, the more I have fell in love with the ideals and principles of this country, and the more I have fell in love with the ideals and principles of this country, the more I have felt the need to stand up for the principles, to challenge authority, to think critically. My teacher, Arthur Quinn, used to tell me that the freedom of expression is not based on the obligation to be right, but the, but the latitude to be wrong. So freedom of expression, pluralism, multitudinous attitudes, multi-perspectival writings, all of these things are that make a civilized community. This is a discussion from a loving heart, but with a critical eye of looking at America itself, while it shows light to the rest of the world, it must also see the same light. It must open up, and it must end oppression of Latinos, of Muslims, of Arabs, and other communities in this country. It cannot be a just leader to the world if it's not just to its own people in this country. On that note, I thank everyone of you. Thank you.